video is an introduction to one-way ANOVA and two-way ANOVA. So this is like the basic idea and you really need to understand this video before you move on to other videos, otherwise the equations just won't make any sense. All right, so first one-way ANOVA. The basic idea here is that you have at least three populations, so three or more populations, and you're trying to compare the mean of each of those populations to see if any of those differ. So our null hypothesis is all the means from all of the populations, all m populations, are equal. And then the alternative hypothesis is at least one of these means differs. All right, so what we're going to do to um, do this test, we're going to compare the variability within each group against the variability between different groups. So if we have m populations, we'll take a sample from each of those m populations, and then we're going to maybe make a plot to visually see the variability within each group and the variability between groups. All right, so imagine we take a sample. Here's our data set. Here's our box plots. Um, here we can see that, yes, there is a little bit of difference in these sample means, but there's a lot of variability within each group. So here we see a lot of variability in this group. That's why the box plot is so long. A lot of variability in this group. That's why the box plot is so long. And so even though there is variability between groups, it's not very much compared to the variability within each group. So here, if we saw box plots like this, it could just mean that the difference in sample means is simply due to random chance. All right, in the second data set here, we see very little variability within each group. So a very tight box plot here, another very tight box, another very tight box. And so we see very little variability within each group compared to the variability between groups. So if we saw a box plot like this, assuming the sample size is large enough, we'd probably be inclined to reject the null hypothesis and say that at least one of these means differs. All right, so again, the null hypothesis is all the means are equal. Alternative hypothesis is at least one of these means differs. You'll notice that if we end up rejecting the alternative hypothesis, we don't yet know which mean is different. All we know is that at least one of the means differs. All right, so that's the um, big idea for one-way ANOVA. For two-way ANOVA, we're changing a little bit. So in one-way ANOVA, we just had one categorical variable. Now in two-way ANOVA, we're going to have two categorical variables. So we still have a quantitative response in both of these. Um, here in two-way ANOVA, we have two categorical variables. OK, so it's easiest if we think about an example. So imagine that we're doing an experiment to look at the temperature of water used when you're washing your clothes and the type of detergent you're using when you're washing your clothes. Um, so imagine you're using two detergents, Tide versus Kirkland, and then your water temperature um, on your washing machine is like cold, warm, or hot. OK, so you want to see if you make the clothes equally dirty in each of these experiments, um, is one of these things going to um, release more dirt, get rid of more dirt from your clothing. So we're trying to measure, as our response, the amount of dirt that's removed from the clothing in one wash cycle. All right, so there's our response, the amount of dirt removed from one wash cycle. Uh, predictors, like we said, the type of detergent used, and then the water temperature. OK, so we can use 2A ANOVA to figure out a whole bunch of things. So one of the things we can figure out is whether one of the detergents removes more dirt. So in other words, if we look, look at the mean for Tide versus the mean for Kirkland, do these differ? All right, next question we can answer is whether one of the water temperatures more effectively removes dirt. So our null hypothesis is going to be the mean for cold water, the mean for warm water, and the mean for hot water. Those are all equal. And then the alternative is one of those means is not equal. OK, and then finally, the thing that we can figure out is whether some combination of detergent and water temperature is more or less effective at removing dirt. So in other words, we're trying to see, is there some good combination that will remove more dirt? Or in other words, we could say, do some detergents work better or worse in certain water temperatures? So it might be, for example, that like Kirkland works the best in hot water, but for Tide, it doesn't really matter, or something like that. All right, you'll notice that this question one and this question two here, those are things that we could answer 
by doing a one-way ANOVA for each one of those. Um, but the advantage of two-way ANOVA is this last question that we get to answer. We get to figure out whether some combination is working. So in other words, we're trying to see, is the interaction term significant? In this video, we start digging into the math of the one-way ANOVA. All right, so first thing we need to do is inform you how this all is working and set up the notation. All right, so what we can imagine is that we have m groups. So that means we have m different means, mu1, mu2, up to mu m. So what we do is we take a, take a sample of size ni from the ith population. All right, so like you go to population one, you take a sample of size n1. Then you go to population two, take a sample of size n2, and so on. Um, in other words, all these sample sizes don't have to be the same across the different populations. All right, so once you have that sample from each one of those populations, we can get our total sample size n by just adding up the sample sizes of each of those uh, samples. All right, so n equals just the sum of the ni. All right, so then we need to define our random sample. So the sample that we take is denoted by xi ni. So this is a random sample of size ni from the ith population. And we're going to assume that these populations have a normal distribution with mean mu i for the ith population and then a shared variance sigma squared. So this is an assumption we're making that the variance is shared across the different populations. All right, so we have our samples, xi, ni, from each of those ith populations. We can think about the mean for each of those populations. So like, what's the mean for population one, what's the mean for population two, and so on. All right, so our sample mean for the ith population, we just add up our sample and then divide by the sample size. So we took a sample of size ni from the ith population. So we're di dividing by that ith population's, that ith group's sample size. And then here, this is just saying we're adding up all of the measurements that we took from that ith population. All right, so we denote this by x bar. And then in the subscript, we have i and then a dot. So that dot just means that we're um, averaging across that second subscript there, the, which, which is shown as j here. All right, so this is how we're going to denote the sample mean taken from population i. All right, so then how are we going to denote our overall mean? We're going to denote it with x bar with two dots in the subscript because we're averaging over both of those subscripts. All right, so we divide by our overall sample size, and we need to add up all of the observations. We need to add up all of our measurements. So the way that we can think about doing this is go to each one of these different groups. So like, let's imagine right now we're at population 1. So then i would be equal to 1. And then we're going to add up all of the measurements we took from population i. So we're going to add up xi1, xi2, xi3, and so on. So we add up all of those measurements from the um, population i equals 1. And then we add up all the measurements from population i equals 2, and so on, until we add have added up all of these different measurements. So we've added up all the different measurements and just divided by the sample size. That's our overall mean. All right, so we have our group means and our overall means. Now we can start actually talking about variability. So remember, in one way ANOVA, we're interested in measuring the variability within groups and the variability between groups, because we want to compare those to see if the variability between groups is really big compared to the variability within groups, then that probably means that we can reject our null hypothesis in favor of our alternative. All right, so how do we measure the variability between groups? Well, let's denote this by SST. So this T is like, if we're thinking about doing an experiment, we have different treatments. So the T here means the treatment for the, um, the treatment here. And SS indicates like sum of squares. So that'll make sense because we're adding up a bunch of things that are squared. All right, so what is the sum of squares for the treatment? Well, let's think about this intuitively for a second. We're measuring the variability between groups. So in other words, 
we want to look at all of these different sample means and see how much variability there is. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to compare each sample mean against the overall mean. So we take each one of these sample means and subtract off the overall mean. So that says how far apart those two things are. And then we square it and multiply by the sample size for that ith population. OK, so this is going to give us our treatment sum of squares. So again, this is measuring the variability between the different sample means. All right, and then later we'll use this notation. MST is the sum of squares for t divided by m minus 1. So remember, m is our number of populations, our number of groups. So what we're doing here is we're taking our total sum of, our treatment sum of squares and then dividing by the number of groups minus 1. So we can think of this kind of like as the mean sum of squares for the treatment. All right, next thing we need to look at is measuring the variability within groups. OK, so what does it mean to have variability within groups? Well, we could look at each group's mean and then see how much the sample varies for that ith population. So we're say we're talking about population 1. We look at the sample mean for population 1. And then we see how much variability is there in the measurements from population 1, how much variability is there around that sample mean from population 1. OK, so say let's work with i equals 1 for now. Um, we go and we take each one of those measurements from sample 1, and we compare it to the sample mean for sample 1. So we're finding all of these differences, squaring them, and adding them up. All right, so now we've done this part for i equals 1. Now we need to do it for i equals 2, i equals 3, all the way to i equals m. So we're adding up all of those squares, and that will be our sum of, squared, sum of squares for the error. OK, so we can think about it kind of like as error because um, we're looking at the variability around some sample mean. And then the mean squared error is going to be the sum of squares for the error. And then we're going to divide by the sample size minus the number of groups. So we'll talk a little bit more about why that's the denominator later. All right, so we have the variability between groups, the variability within groups. Now we need to talk about, well, what is the total variability? And very conveniently, the total variability is just the variability within groups plus the variability between groups. OK, so we're going to denote the total variability by SSTO. And what we're going to do is just compare each observation against that overall mean. All right, so this differs from like this one, because here we're measuring the variability compared to each group's sample mean. Here we're comparing it to the overall mean. So take every observation, find the distance between that and the overall mean, square it, add all of those up. So that's the total sum of squares. OK, so intuitively, if we are looking at the total variability, it can really only come from two sources. It can either arise because of error, in other words, variability within groups, or it can arise because the treatments um, are different. So in other words, the variability between groups. So that means that the total sum of squares is equal to the treatment sum of squares plus SSE. And then mathematically, if you want to think about it that way, um, if you write this out and then expand it, you'll see that the cross term is actually 0. And they go through that in the book if you would like to check that out. In the last ANOVA video, we set the notation, and now we can actually get into the theory behind the one-way ANOVA. All right, so um, remember that we just left off saying that the total sum of squares equals the treatment sum of squares plus SSE. So if we want to, we can divide by a constant all the way across, and that's just fine. So um, we divide across by sigma squared. All right, so if you look at your book, Theorem 931, then it says that the total Sorry, the treatment sum of squares and SSE are independent. OK, so 
If we look at this first piece and break that down, we're going to see that it's a chi-squared random variable with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Similarly, if we look at SSE, that that's also, sorry, SSE divided by sigma squared, that's also a chi-squared random variable with m minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right, so this is a chi-squared random variable. This is a chi-squared random variable. And this and this are independent of each other. So if we remember back in our MGF days from last semester, if we, sorry, that's moment generating function, if we have a chi-squared random variable equals something plus a chi-squared random variable, then that's going to mean that this is also a chi-squared chi random variable. And remember the way that these work is that if we have chi-squared with however many degrees of freedom plus chi-squared with m minus 1 degrees of freedom, that equals chi-squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So in other words, the degrees of freedom just add. So if this has n minus 1 degrees of freedom, and this has m minus 1 degrees of freedom, and this is chi-squared, then it's not a mystery how many degrees of freedom it has. We know that it's going to be n minus m degrees of freedom, because we need n minus m plus m minus 1 to equal n minus 1. All right. So, under the null hypothesis, then, this must be a chi-squared chi random variable with n minus m degrees of freedom. All right, so remember that this whole one-way ANOVA stuff, we're looking at comparing the variability within groups to the variability between groups. So let's start thinking about that variability within groups and the variability between groups. All right, so under the null hypothesis, the treatment sum of squares divided by sigma squared, we just said, is chi-squared distributed with m minus 1 degrees of freedom. Remember, if we have a chi-squared random variable and we want to get its mean, that's just going to be equal to the number of degrees of freedom that that chi-squared has. Okay, so we have m minus 1 degrees of freedom, so that means this random variable, SST divided by sigma squared, that means that this has expectation m minus 1. All right. M minus 1, that's a constant. Sigma squared, that's a constant. So there's no harm done in moving these around. So we could have the expectation of SST divided by M minus 1, and that will equal sigma squared under the null hypothesis. So you might be tempted to say, OK, if we want to estimate sigma squared, let's just take the treatment sum of squares and divide by M minus 1. But this is not a good way to estimate our sigma squared because this all relies on the null hypothesis being true. So if it's not true, we're actually going to be overestimating sigma squared. All right, so now we know something about how this is distributed. Um, let's think now about the null hypothesis. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. SSE divided by sigma squared is going to have a chi-squared random variable, um, is going to be a chi-squared random variable with n minus m degrees of freedom. So same sort of thing, if we take the expectation of this, it's going to have n minus m as its expectation. All right, so since this does not rely on the null hypothesis being true, we can use this MSE to um, estimate sigma squared, and it will be an unbiased estimator. All right. So we know we have a chi-squared and a chi-squared, and that they're independent. So it says our theorem in the book. And so if we take a chi-squared random variable and divide by another chi-squared random variable, as long as they're independent, then we're going to end up with an f random variable. All right, so that's exactly what we're going to do. So we said that MST has a chi-squared random variable, MSE has a chi-squared random variable, they're independent, so this, which will be our test statistic, will actually have an F distribution with M minus 1 degrees of freedom and N minus M degrees of freedom under the null hypothesis. So this all relies on being under the null hypothesis because we need SST over sigma squared to have a chi-squared distribution, and the only way that's going to happen is if the null hypothesis is true. So under the null hypothesis, here's our test statistic. It's going to have this distribution, f with m minus 1 degrees of freedom and n minus m degrees of freedom. All right, so let's think about this logically. We said that if the variability between groups is much larger than the variability within groups, 
then we're going to want to reject the null hypothesis. So what's the variability between groups? That's that MST. And then the variability within groups, that's that MSE. So here we're looking at the variability between groups divided by the variability within groups. So if this quantity is a lot bigger than one, and a lot will be defined by our p-value, if that quantity, that test statistic, is a lot bigger than one, then we're going to want to reject the null hypothesis. All right, so in other words, the bigger that test statistic gets, the more we're going to want to reject the null hypothesis. So our p-value is going to be the right tail. All right, so here's our F distribution with m minus one degrees of freedom and n minus m degrees of freedom. Here's our test statistic, MST over MSE, and then the p-value is going to be the area to the right of that test statistic. Because, like we said, as our test statistic gets larger and larger, we're going to want to reject the null hypothesis more and more. And so as we move further to the right with our test statistic, our p-value is going to be getting smaller and smaller, thus letting us have more and more evidence against the null hypothesis. So in the previous video, we went through all the math of one way ANOVA, and now we can talk about how we summarize it. So lots of times we'll summarize it in what's called an ANOVA table here. And the way it works is we have a column for the source of variability, a column for the sum of squares, a column for the degrees of freedom, a column for the mean squares, and then finally, our test statistic. All right, so remember that we have the treatment, sum of squares and the SSE because we have two sources of error, uh, two sources of variability, the treatment and the error. All right, so then we, in the next column, have our degrees of freedom. So this is the number of populations or number of groups minus one, and then this is the overall sample size minus the number of groups. All right, so when we look at the total, this total will add. So remember, the total sum of squares is equal to SST plus SSE. Similarly, the total degrees of freedom equals N minus 1, which is M minus 1 plus N minus M. All right, so F sum of squares and degrees of freedom add. And once we get to the next column, these no longer add. So here in this next column, we have the mean squares. So MST is just SST divided by M minus 1. So we just take this column, divide by that column. Similarly, for MSE, we take this column, divide by that column. So it's pretty easy, as long as we organize it this way, it's super easy to remember what, um, how to calculate mean squares. And then finally, when we get to our test statistic, remember that's just MST divided by MSE. So again, that's pretty easy. We just look at this column, take this value, divide by that value, and that's our test statistic. Okay, so remember, under the null hypothesis, that test statistic has an F distribution with m minus 1 degrees of freedom and n minus m degrees of freedom. And remember, the larger the test set is, the more evidence we have against the null hypothesis. So here I've drawn our F distribution with m minus 1 and n minus m degrees of freedom. And then here marked is our test statistic, MST over MSE. And then the p-value is just the area to the right of that. In a previous video, we very briefly introduced two way ANOVA, and now we're going to get into more of the details, more of the notation. All right, so remember that in two way ANOVA, we have two categorical variables. So every measurement has two categorical variables associated with it. So like if our um, categorical variables are the water temperature and the brand of detergent, then every measurement that we take, every experiment that we run, we will have some detergent that we're using, whatever brand, Kirkland, Tide, whatever, and then the water temperature, so cold, warm, or hot. All right, so each measurement has two attributes. All right, so if we want, we could look at a bunch of different things. We could look at the average dirt removed by each detergent by averaging over the different water temperatures, or we could average over the different detergents to look at the average amount of dirt removed by each water temperature. And then finally, if we have more than one observation for each one of those water temp detergent brand combos, then we can take the average for each one of those combos so that we can say like, okay, the average amount of dirt removed by Tide in warm water is this much. But we can only take an average, right, if we have more than one observation for each one of those combos. Um, and it'll make it a little bit 
easier on the notation if first we look at one observation per combo. So we actually won't be able to answer this third question here quite yet. We'll get to that in a little bit though. So for now we're going to set things up so that we can look at the average dirt removed by each detergent and the average dirt removed by each water temperature. Okay, so let's generalize this more. So let's say that we have two factors, not just water temp and the brand of detergent. Let's say that we have factor A and factor B. Factor A has A categories or levels. Factor B has B categories or levels. All right, so we're going to denote each observation by Xij. So Xij we're going to assume has a normal distribution with mean mu ij and variance sigma squared. And again, just like in the one-way ANOVA, we're going to assume that sigma squared is a shared variance. All right, so we're going to have one observation per combo, so that means we'll have i equals 1 through a and j equals 1 through b. So in other words, this first subscript, the i, that's for factor a. The second subscript, b, that's for factor the second subscript is J, and that's for factor B. Okay, so since we have one observation per combo, then if we take the number of levels in A and the number of levels in B, that's going to be our overall sample size. All right, so we said that we could look at the average dirt removed by each detergent and the average dirt removed by each water temperature. So in other words, let's find the mean for each level of factor A and the mean for each level of factor B. All right, so if we're looking at the ith level of factor A, then we're looking for the mean for the ith level, and we're going to uh, average over all of the different j's. So this would be like we're finding the average dirt removed by each detergent, and we're averaging over all the different water temperatures. Okay, so this x bar i dot is 1 divided by b, which is the number of levels in factor B, and we're going to add up all the temperatures, sorry, all the observations xij, where this i and that i are the same. So we're adding up over all the j's. Okay, similar thing for our factor B. If we're going to look for the mean for the j's level of B, we'll denote that by x bar dot j. So we'll add up all the observations for that jth level and all the different levels for the first factor. So we add all those up, divide by the sample size, which is A, which is the number of levels in factor A. And then our overall mean, we're just going to add up all of our observations for all of the, all of the levels in B and all of the levels in A, and then we're going to divide by our sample size, which is 1 over A times B. All right, so we've got most of our notation down, so now we can define like the total sum of squares and all that stuff. So the total sum of squares, remember, is going to be, we're going to take each one of these observations and find the distance between it and the mean, that overall grand mean. So we find that distance, square it, add all of those up, and that's our total sum of squares. So this is pretty much a very direct extension of the one-way ANOVA. All right, so if we manipulate this a little bit, we'll end up getting that this total sum of squares is equal to b times this sum, which is saying, let's look at the variability for the um, different levels in A. So we'll look at, okay, the first level in A, and take that mean and subtract off the grand mean, find that distance there, square it, add all those up. So we're going to find, we're going to be looking at the variability among the means for factor A. Here we're going to be looking at the variability for the means for factor B, so that's a similar thing. And then here we're going to be looking at xij minus the mean for the ith level of A minus the mean for the jth level of B minus that overall grand mean. Okay, so this is, um, this part here is like what we would predict xij to be, and this is what it actually is. So it's again, same thing as usual, 
like observed minus predicted. So we take that observed, subtract off the group mean, square it, and then add all of those up. All right, so we're going to call this piece SSA. This piece is SSB, and then that final piece is SSE. So this is the sum of squares for factor A, this is the sum of squares for factor B, and then this is the sum of squares due to error. All right, so we're going to use this notation to move forward and actually like get our test statistics and distributions and all that sort of stuff in the next video. Now that we've set up some of the notation for this 2A ANOVA, we can actually get into some of the mathematical properties, statistical properties of these different things that we've set up. All right, so we just left off by saying that the total sum of squares equals the sum of squares from A plus the sum of squares from B plus the sum of squares due to error. All right, so that's what we set up. And then now, if we think back to how we did things in one way ANOVA, we set up those sum of squares, and then we figured out, OK, what is the distribution of each of these components? So that's exactly what we're going to do here. And just like in one way ANOVA, we're going to see that each of these components is chi-squared distributed. All right, so we want to show that sum of squares for A over sigma squared, sum of squares for B over sigma squared, and sum of squares due to error over sigma squared are each independent chi-squared random variables as long as some hypotheses are true. So this is just like we did for the one-way ANOVA. We said we were going to show that these are chi-squared distributed as long as the null is true in one-way ANOVA. So in two-way ANOVA, we're testing the means for A and the means for B. So we need to say two sets of hypotheses. So the null for A is that the means among A's different levels are equal. And the null hypothesis for B is the means among B's different levels are equal. So if we want to think of an example, then for the null hypothesis for A, that might be saying, like, the different detergents remove an equal amount of dirt on average. And then the null hypothesis for B would be saying that the different water temperatures remove an equal amount of dirt on average. All right, so those are the hypotheses we're going to work under to show that these different components are chi-squared distributed. All right, so let's go ahead and start from there. We'll assume that H A and H B are true. So if you remember from one way ANOVA, this total sum of squares is chi-squared distributed, and its degrees of freedom is just the sample size minus one. So remember, we're working in the situation here where we have one observation per combo of detergent and water, or in other words, one observation per combo of each of A's levels and each of B's levels. So the number of levels is A times B. That's the total number of different combos we could have, so that's the sample size. N is A times B, and so our um, degrees of freedom for SS total over sigma squared is AB minus 1. All right, so if we use that theorem that we talked about back in one way ANOVA, then we know that SSA over sigma squared is going to be chi-squared distributed with A minus 1 degrees of freedom. So remember, the degrees of freedom is the number of levels in A minus 1. And then same story for SSB over sigma squared. Again, degrees of freedom is number of levels in B minus 1. All right, so that means that um, this piece over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed. This piece over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed. And this piece over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed. Also, from the theorem we used back in one way ANOVA, we know that SSA over sigma squared and SSB over sigma squared are independent. So what that tells us is that since this is chi-squared and this over sigma squared is chi-squared, this over sigma squared is chi-squared, therefore this plus this over sigma squared is also chi-squared distributed. All right, so where that puts us is that this over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed and this piece is also chi-squared distributed. So therefore, if we have chi-squared plus something is a chi-squared, that must mean that then this is also chi-squared distributed. So if we think back to MGFs, that can help you understand that. All right, so SSE over sigma squared must be chi-squared distributed. 
but what about the degrees of freedom? Well, we know that the degrees of freedom should add, right? Um, so if we know the degrees of freedom for SS total over sigma squared, and we know the degrees of freedom for this chunk over sigma squared, then we know that we can just add these to get there. So the degrees of freedom for SS total over sigma squared is AB minus 1. And then we figured out that the degrees of freedom for this piece over sigma squared is a minus 1 plus b minus 1. So then that leaves the degrees of freedom for SS due to error over sigma squared. And so it must be then the degrees of freedom here is equal to a minus 1 times b minus 1. All right, so now we figured out that SS total over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed. And SSA over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed. SSB over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed. These two components are independent of each other. And then finally, SSE over sigma squared is also chi-squared distributed. And we have all the degrees of freedom here. So that will help us set up the test statistics in the next video. In the previous video, we figured out a few things. So if the means among A's different levels and if the means among B's different levels are equal, then we said that SS total over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed with AB minus 1 degrees of freedom. SSA over sigma squared is also chi-squared distributed with A minus 1 degrees of freedom. Um, similar story for um, SSB over sigma squared. and then. SSE over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed with A minus 1 times B minus 1 degrees of freedom. And finally, SSA over sigma squared, SSB over sigma squared, and SSE over sigma squared are all independent random variables. All right, so now we can work with these facts, work with these findings to derive our test statistics to test whether the means among A's different levels are truly equal. All right, so say we want to do just that. So let's work first with the null hypothesis for A, and then we can do the exact same thing for the null hypothesis for B. So we want to test whether the means among A's different levels are equal. So remember from one way ANOVA what we did is we compared the variability between groups to the variability within groups. So that's exactly what we're going to do here again. So we're going to test, set up the test stat the exact same way. So we have um, the variability between groups up in the numerator and the variability um, within groups in the denominator. So this is the test stat for testing whether A's different means are equal. All right, so if the null hypothesis actually were true, then this should be pretty small or maybe about 1. But if the means are actually different, then we're going to see SSE, sorry, SSA is going to be bigger than expected. So we're going to compare this test statistic against its sampling distribution. So what's its sampling distribution? Well, we know that SSA over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed with a minus 1 degrees of freedom. We know SSE over sigma squared is chi-squared distributed with a minus 1 times b minus 1 degrees of freedom. Therefore, this divided by this is going to have an F distribution. So we're going to compare this test statistic against an F distribution. DF1 is going to be A minus 1. DF2 is A minus 1 times B minus 1. All right, so when our test statistic is large compared to this distribution, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis that the means amongst A's different levels are equal. So here's our little picture. We have our F distribution with A minus 1 and A minus 1 times B minus 1 degrees of freedom. We've marked off our test stat. And we've shaded the area to the right because the, that represents larger, more extreme test statistics. So that area to the right, that's our p-value. So our p-value is the probability that this F distribution is greater than our test statistic. All right, one more thing. We probably want to have a good unbiased estimator for sigma squared. And so we can do just that. So if the null hypothesis for A were true, we could do something with SSA. And if the null hypothesis for B were true, we could do something with SSB to figure out a good estimator for sigma squared. But we can't rely on those being true, right? We can't rely on the means amongst A's different groups being true. We can't rely on the means amongst B's different groups being true. So what we're going to rely on is SSE over sigma squared having a chi-squared distribution with 
a minus 1 times b minus 1 degrees of freedom. Because whether the null for a and the null for b, whether those are true or false, it doesn't matter. This finding, number 5 here, that's still going to be true. So SSE over sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with a minus 1 times b minus 1 degrees of freedom. Therefore, a good unbiased estimator for sigma squared is going to be SSE divided by a minus 1 times b minus 1. In our previous work with two-factor ANOVA, we had two factors, but we only had one observation for each combo of levels in A and levels in B. So in other words, we only had like one observation for tide with cold water. But now we want to move from just having one observation for tied with cold water to having more than one observation. All right, so when we only had like one observation for each combo of detergent and water temperature, we were restricted to testing just two hypotheses. So one of the hypotheses was, are the means among A's different levels equal? And are the means among B's different levels equal? But we were not able to test when we only had one observation per combo. We were not able to test, is there some combo of A and B that has a different mean from the other means from the other combos of A and B? All right, so we want to test for this interaction between A and B. So what we're going to do is increase our number of observations from 1 to some larger number C. All right, so we're going to denote each observation now that we have multiple observations for each combo. We're going to need three subscripts. All right, so each observation is going to be called X, I, J, K. So I is for the level of A. J is for the level of B, and then K is for um, which like iteration we've done. So like if we're on the second trial for this combo of A and B, then K is going to be equal to 2. So if we're having um, C different observations for each combo, then K is going to go from 1 to C. All right, so I goes from 1 to A because I is for the different levels of A. J goes from 1 to B because um, J is for the different levels of B, and then K tells us which number experiment we are on for that exact combo of A and B. All right, so since we have A different levels of A, B different levels of B, and C different runs for each combo, then that means that our sample size is A times B times C. All right, so that's our overall sample size. All right, so just like we did before, we need to define some notation. So let's go ahead and do that. So again, when we have a mean and then we have a dot, that means we're going to be averaging over that subscript. So if we have x bar i j dot, that means we're going to be averaging over the k subscript, which means, all right, for this combo of level of A and level of B, let's take the mean. So this is like the mean amount of dirt removed if we use this type of detergent and whatever temperature of water. And then x bar i dot dot, so we're averaging over the last two subscripts. So that means that um, this might be like the mean amount of dirt removed by one of the detergents, like the ice level might be tied. And then x bar dot j dot, that means that we're averaging to find the mean amount of dirt removed by whatever water temperature we're looking at, whatever water temperature J is. And then finally, that overall grand mean is x bar dot dot dot. OK, so if we're trying to find um, the mean for the ice level of A, then that means we have to add up all the different water temperatures and all the different um, trials that we've run. So we add over J and K and then divide by the sample size, which is B times C. Similar story for x bar dot J dot. Our sample size, our number of thingies that we're adding up is 1 over A times C. And what are the thingies that we're adding up? Well, we're adding over the ith subscript and the kth subscript. So that's what we're doing here. We're adding from I equals 1 to A and from K equals 1 to C. And then finally, for this last one, we're adding everything up because we're looking for that grand mean. So we add them all up. We're adding over all three of these indices and dividing by the overall sample size. All right, so that's our notation. 
now we need to go ahead and write down our total sum of squares. So as you can notice, this is kind of following exactly what we did for one-way ANOVA and two-way ANOVA. We're just making it more complicated. So remember our total sum of squares, that's going to be just our variability between each observation and the grand mean. So we have one observation minus the grand mean, square it, and do that for all of our data points. So we're adding over i equals 1 to a, j equals 1 to b, and k equals 1 to c. All right, so if we maneuver this, just like we did in the one-way ANOVA stuff, we can rewrite this as, this total sum of squares, as b times c times the variability amongst a's different levels plus a times c times the variability amongst B diff b's different levels. And then here's the variability amongst um, the different combos of A and B. And then finally, we have our error term, which is describing how much variability is there within one combo of level of A and level of B. So remember x bar ij, that's the mean for some combo, and then xij, k is one observation. So we're saying, OK, let's compare each observation within some combo of a and b to what its mean is. Square that, add them all up. All right, so what that tells us is that this is our sum of squares for a. This piece is our sum of squares for b. The middle piece here is our sum of squares for the interaction. And then finally, this last piece here is the sum of squares due to error. All right, so in the next video, we're going to talk about the distributions of each of these and then find our test stats. Now that we have set up the notation for our two-way ANOVA with multiple observations for each combo of A and B, we can actually get into some of the statistical properties. All right, so just like in all our previous ANOVA situations, the total sum of squares divided by sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. But what is n? n is a times b times c. So SS total over sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with a times b times c minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right, so if we use our same line of reasoning as in our previous ANOVAs, then we know that SSA over sigma squared, SSB over sigma squared, SSAB over sigma squared, and SSE over sigma squared are all independent, and we're going to see that each one of these has a chi-squared distribution. All right, so SSA over sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with a minus 1 degrees of freedom as long as our null hypothesis for a is true. In other words, as long as the means among a's different levels are all equal, then SSA over sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with a minus 1 degrees of freedom. Similarly, when the means amongst b's different levels are all equal, then SSB over sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with b minus 1 degrees of freedom. Similarly, when the means amongst all combos of a and b are equal, in other words, when there's no interaction term, then SSAB over sigma squared has a chi-squared distribution with a minus 1 times b minus 1 degrees of freedom. All right, so if we have chi-squared equals chi-squared plus chi-squared plus chi-squared plus something, then we know that that last thingy has to be a chi-squared random variable as well. So that's exactly what we have going on, just like we've been seeing all along. So SSE over sigma squared must be a chi-squared random variable. And to find its degrees of freedom, we would just use the fact that degrees of freedom add. So we know that a minus 1 plus b minus 1 plus a minus 1 times b minus 1 plus whatever the degrees of freedom are for SSE over sigma squared must equal n minus 1, which is a times b times c minus 1. 
So if we just do a little bit of arithmetic, we can find that the degrees of freedom for SSE over a sigma squared is a times b times c minus 1. All right, so now we have all those chi-squared random variables set up. We can now do some of our test stats. So say that we want to test whether there is an interaction term. So we're trying to figure out, is there some combo of detergent and water temperature that will more effectively or less effectively remove dirt from clothing? So we're going to use this test statistic here. We're going to look at the variability among the different interaction terms. So we're looking at SSAB. And we're comparing it to the variability within the interactions. In other words, we're looking at the variability due to error, so the variability um, amongst all our different runs of the same type of detergent and the same temperature of water. So our test stat is, we can call it FAB, the sum of squares for AB divided by the degrees of freedom, which is A minus 1 times B minus 1. And then in the denominator, we have SSE divided by A times B times C minus 1. All right, so that's our test statistic. We know that the numerator is a chi-squared, the denominator is a chi-squared, and they're independent. Therefore, this test statistic must be an F random variable. And its degrees of freedom are, this is the first degree of degrees of freedom, and this is the second degrees of freedom. So it's an F with A minus 1 times B minus 1 degrees of freedom for the first degrees of freedom, and the second degrees of freedom is A times B times C minus 1. All right, so this test stat has this F distribution under the null hypothesis. So as long as, in reality, there's no interaction term, then this will be true. So in other words, as long as actually there's no combo of water temperature and detergent that does better or worse than the other ones, then this distribution, this uh, test stat has this sampling distribution here. All right, so then we can find our p-value by looking at, as always, our right tail. So here's our F distribution with A minus 1 times B minus 1 degrees of freedom for the first degrees of freedom, and then A times B times C minus 1 for the second degrees of freedom. We mark off our test stat here, FAB, and we look at the area to the right, and that is our p-value. So if we have a small p-value, then we can say, actually, there must be some interaction that has a different mean than the others. In other words, there's some combo of detergent and water temperature that more effectively or less effectively removes dirt from clothing. And if our p-value is too big, then we would say there is no combo of water temperature and detergent that more or less effectively removes dirt from clothing. All right, so that's how we would test our interaction term. Now let's talk about these main effects. So I'll show you just for A, but B is the exact same story. Um, so to test whether any of A's levels have a different mean, we're going to use this test statistic here. So again, we're going to look at the variability amongst A's different levels and compare it to the um, variability within groups. OK, so we have SSA divided by number of levels in A minus 1 in the numerator. And then our denominator is SSE divided by A times B times C minus 1. All right, so that's our test statistic. If all the means for the levels of A are actually equal, then that test statistic will have an F distribution with A minus 1 times A times B times C minus 1 degrees of freedom. And our p-value again, we're going to draw out our F distribution, mark off our test stat, and the p-value is the area to the right. So our p-value is the probability that an F distribution with A minus 1 and A times B times C minus 1 degrees of freedom is greater than our test statistic. And then finally, a good thing to know, again, would be an unbiased estimator for sigma squared. So that's going to be similar to all the previous ANOVAs that we've looked at, SSE divided by A times B times quantity C minus 1. 
All right, so that wraps up all the ANOVA stuff. It would be very useful to um, look at the ANOVA tables in the book just to help you kind of organize everything um, as you're preparing to work on this in class.